Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down like a fraction. We're asking questions like, hey, what do these Gospels have to do with me? How can we take these Gospels and apply them into our daily living? so that we can become a reflection of God's love to a world that doesn't know God and definitely is in deep need of more love. Don't you think? I mean, take a look around. There's a lot of bad news bears out there. How can I take the good news of Jesus Christ and apply it into my daily living so that I can become a light in this darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God making present His kingdom. Not someday in some wishful thinking kind of way, but today and every day. And that is what this show is all about, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Oh, we got a good one, Feeding of the 5,000. This is an amazing gospel. There are many lessons to be learned here. So I ask you, turn off your phone. Just be present for the next 30 minutes, because God has got a lesson for you. We spent so much time running here, running there, doing this, doing that. How often do we just say, God, what am I doing? Where am I going? God wants to lead you. And he does it in many ways. But one very powerful way is his word. So what do he say? I quit yipping and we get right to it. We are hearing from the Gospel of John. Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes, he saw that a large crowd was coming to him. He said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there, were a great, there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than enough to eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is truly the prophet, the one who was to come into the world. Since Jesus knew they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. The gospel of the Lord. Now, what a gospel it is, my friend. This is a deep pool. There's a whole lot to learn calling the kids. This is Daily Living from Father Chapin. You hang out. We'll be right back. And we're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm gonna share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living, and together, we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. So today we got a gospel. Oh, it's very special. And I, and I, I know I say that about the gospels all the time. And it's hard to pick your favorite gospel. It's like picking your favorite kid. But some do seem to rise up to the top. And the ones, uh, some of the ones that I really love don't even feature a tremendous miracle like in the classic sense. For example, Woman at the Well is one of my favorites. And I suppose the, the fact that Jesus could see right through this woman in her past as he can see through you and I was a miracle. But there's a whole lot 
a whole lot to learn from that gospel, Woman at the Well. Good Samaritan comes to mind. Love, love that gospel. Teed up by the lawyer's questions, and who is my neighbor? But as far as flash factor, like real big time miracles, I'm thinking, well, raising of Lazarus comes to mind. Storm at sea, or healing of the man born blind. But if you're trying to locate the pivotal miracle, the, the one that changed everything, the miracle that transformed Jesus from a relatively unknown regional figure to a man that everybody's talking about throughout the nation of Israel, it's got to be the feeding of 5,000, which is the only miracle outside of the resurrection that is recounted in all four Gospels, which gives you kind of a sense of how important it was. So what does it mean? And more importantly, how can we apply this into our daily living? You know, recently I, I celebrated my 14th anniversary as a priest. And, I, and I, love, I love being a priest. First three years, I was an associate pastor or, or what they call a parochial vicar uh, in, in Beckley for two years and then Inwood. These are small towns in West Virginia. But then I was assigned my first parish as a pastor of St. Charles in Greenbrier County in a small little town called White Sulphur Springs. It's nestled in the southern mountains of West Virginia. Now, now White Sulphur Springs is known as the home of the Greenbrier Hotel. It was built in 1778, so it's got to be one of the oldest resorts in the country, and it's beautiful, and it sits in a valley directly across the street from my former parish. So I used to go over to the hotel and walk the grounds, you know, for my exercise, because I had this beautiful trail that wound through the golf course called the Valley View Trail. And to get to the trail, you kind of have to go through the hotel. So I'm walking through the hotel one day, and I pass by this fine art gallery. Real nice artwork. Not necessarily the kind of place where I would buy anything for myself, because as fine art tends to be, it's a bit outside of my price range. But looking's for free, and I love looking at paintings. My mother is a painter, my aunt is a painter, and, and so one day I'm walking through the hotel and I, I come upon this art gallery, it was new, and I went in to take a look. And there's all these amazing paintings, right? So I'm looking at these paintings, and, and I come across this one painting, and it literally took my breath away, as only art can do. This painting wonderfully depicts the feeding of the 5,000. And like I said, I was incredibly moved, still am to this day. I mean, they say that a picture paints a thousand words, and I guess that's true, but it really goes beyond words. It's visceral. It's emotional. A good painting can reach down into your soul and just grab it. And this one did, and like I said, continues to to this day. So let's talk about it. Where do you even start? Well, I, I guess we could start with this amazing light that you see reflecting on the Jordanian mountains. You see that, that soft golden hue, this amber glow? Photographers will refer to this as the golden hour, which I don't know if it actually lasts for an hour, but it's magical. You know, I, I've got a life-size uh, white concrete statue of Jesus right in front of my rectory. It sits in a flower garden with a flat tombstone right in front of it that says, we need to talk. And in the late afternoon, when the conditions are just right, as the sun sets in the west, it will cast a golden hue and just light up that white concrete to it's just it's it's amber glowing. It's it's amazing. And that's what's going on with these mountains here. The artist captures it beautifully. It's one of those little details that you know you might miss. But my friends, light is everything. Now, if you contrast that light on the mountains, as you move to the left, you see these storm clouds rolling in right here and behind Jesus, which brings to mind what we talked about several weeks ago. I don't know how long ago. We were talking about storm of sea. Remember that? We were talking about storm of sea. And if you were with us, 
we were talking about the unique topography of the Sea of Galilee and how it creates weather patterns that are rather unusual. The Sea of Galilee, also known as Lake Genesaret, is the lowest fresh body of water in the world, 660, no, 686 feet below sea level. So it sits in a bowl surrounded by these high mountains. I've been there, it's stunning. But the upshot is this, particularly in the winter, when the cold air rushes down these mountains and it meets the warmer temperature of the lake, it can kick up a squall like in just a matter of minutes. I mean, it can be a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, and all of a sudden, without warning, you're in the middle of a huge storm, which is kind of how life is, isn't it? So that's just the background, and it's gorgeous. And we haven't even gotten to the real action yet, which, not surprisingly, is Jesus, who is the focal point of the painting. This is where you, uh, your eye lands on Jesus. But, but getting back to that light, that amber glow, that, that, that golden hour, can you see how the same light is bathing the face of Jesus, unlike anybody else in the painting? And as he's looking up, even though he's surrounded by all these people, you get a sense that in this moment, at least, he is alone. And he's looking up to heaven beyond all the distraction. And his posture is communicating gratitude. Which we often see that Jesus takes bread. And what does he do before he gives it to the other? He always he gives thanks. And there's a lesson there, right there. We can't even begin to pray until we locate our gratitude. So here we have Jesus, and he's holding this wicker basket, giving thanks. We can assume that it, this basket has at least a portion of the barley loaves and the fish that have been offered by the boy. And of course, the boy is standing right in front of Jesus. And you see this boy, he's in the moment. <laughs> he is in the moment. He's just waiting to see what Jesus is going to do. Now, moving behind the boy, who is this man standing directly behind the boy? I don't know. I mean, we're just talking here. But given the way he's standing, you know, all barrel-chested, looking around, keeping an eye on the situation, kind of like a bodyguard, I'm guessing this is Peter. I mean, because doesn't he look kind of like a take charge kind of guy here. And as you move down to his left, or actually, as you move in front of him, in the forefront of the painting, these guys that are facing away from us are looking back at Jesus, who of course is the focal point of the painting. You know, these guys that are standing around with these empty whisker baskets all around them, I'm guessing they're the other disciples. Now, getting back to Peter, when you move down to the right, you know, his left, I'm thinking that this is the boy's mother. And she could be my favorite character, uh, obviously outside of Jesus, of course. She could be my favorite in the whole painting because I just love this expression. Do you see how, she, how, how her hands are covering her mouth? She is communicating very powerfully just utter shock and awe. Why? Because her son, is standing in front of the master. Her boy has managed to put himself into the middle of this miracle. Somehow Jesus is using what he is giving him to make all of this happen. And she's stunned. Now, moving down to the right, I'm guessing that this little boy right here is the boy's little brother. And I love this little guy. <laughs> he don't know exactly what's going on, but you can sense that he can sense that it's pretty important because his bowed head is communicating a sense of reverence. Moving to his right, well, it would be his left, but to the right, would be the boy's aunt or the mother's sister. And she's holding a baby, and that baby would be the boy's cousin. And of course, babies being babies, Baby's totally clueless, and the baby's looking back down the hill at the massive crowd of people, which I love the crowd. Love the crowd. 
Because understand, this, this is not CGI or computer generated imagery. The artist painstakingly painted all these people individually and they just kind of fade into the background. Who are these people? Who are these nameless, faceless people? Who are these people that are following Jesus? These people who are searching, these people who are empty. Well, they are, in a word, us. Finally, check out behind Jesus. Who's this guy? I mean, to me, he kind of looks like what Moses would look like. But Look at the way his hands are clasped and he's looking downward. Do you notice how his right shoulder is dipped slightly lower than his left? It seems to be communicating a sense of gratitude. And the woman to his right and, and the man to his left, I'm guessing they're his kids or his children who seem to have no idea what's going on with their father. And I don't know either. It's a mystery. But it seems like Jesus has done something very special for this man. But whatever that something was, we'll never know. I guess it will remain between him and Jesus. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. A monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with and I will send you a monthly newsletter and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal, and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Not just for the break, we were talking about this amazing painting. I find this painting extremely moving. A wonderful depiction of the miracle of the feeding of 5,000. But you know, I could see how someone might look at this painting and say, well, you know, Father, see, it's a, it's, it's a nice painting, but uh, where's all the food? Where's the miracle? I mean, they might say, sure, it's a nice painting, but how is this a depiction of the miracle of the feeding of 5,000 when nothing has happened yet? I mean, I suppose it's about ready to happen, but it hadn't happened yet. This is all just before the miracle. This is a prelude to the real action that is to come. But hold on there, Sparky, not so fast. I don't know about that. Let's talk about this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. You can read all about it in the first chapter of Genesis. It's all there, black and white. God says, let there be light, and there's light. God says, let there be this, there's this, let there be that, there's that. In other words, he speaks everything into existence. So his words have created power. But then it comes to God making us. And something very peculiar happens. God says, let us make man in our own image. What does that really mean? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Does that mean that when I look into the mirror, this is what God looks like? Because, I, you know, I was hoping for better. Of course not. God doesn't have a body. God is spirit. Of course, we, we want to picture God as, as an old man with a gray beard in the sky, but that's called anthropomorphism. God doesn't have a body. God is spirit. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, it means that we share God's essence. We have godly essence in us. We have God particles in us. Some call this the divine spark. 
I've heard it described as having a galaxy in our heart. What's the galaxy? The galaxy is God. He's not out there somewhere. He's in us. He's here. Why? Because he created us in his image, meaning we were created in the essence of God. And what is the essence of God? To create. That's what God does. God is the great creator. He creates, as opposed to the evil one, who creates nothing. All the evil one can do is distort what God has already created. That's why every sin has a small, tiny little sliver of goodness in it. Because sin is nothing more than a distortion of the perfection that God has already created. Now, we as his people, as children of God, we have been created in his image. So we have been created with this creative essence in us. So we are, in a very real sense, many creators. And just as his words have creative power, so do ours. We can speak life into this world. We can speak death into this world. It is our choice. Now, let's get back to Genesis for a moment. Because something very interesting happens in the second chapter. 20th verse. It's a small detail. But as often is the case with small details, they can have profound consequences. God allows Adam to name the animals. Why would he do that? Do you think that God just couldn't come up with the names that day? Do you think that God was having a creative block that day? Of course not. So why would God allow Adam to name the animals? Well, may I suggest that God allows Adam to name the animals because God is inviting Adam, as he invites us, to become co-creators with him to make his kingdom come to pass. Now, this is a huge concept. And I want you to just kind of slide it all into the back burner because we'll get back to it. But for now, let's get back to the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus is the word. The Word made flesh. So Jesus is God. So what that means is that the fullness of power to create resides in Jesus. So he can create any way he chooses. So when he wanted to feed this crowd, he could have snapped his fingers and flame and yawns, meeting rare, could have dropped from the sky with a side salad. It could have happened. But he does not choose to do this. Rather, he turns to Philip and he says, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? Which is kind of a ridiculous question, but of course he already knows what he's going to do. Scripture even tells us he says this to test him. And this is, of course, when Andrew pipes up and says, there's a boy here with five barley loaves and fish and two fish. And what good are those for so many? So let me ask you a question, my friend. Do you think that Jesus had to steal this boy's lunch to make this miracle happen. Of course not. No more than God needed Adam to come up with the names of the animals. We know that Jesus has the power to create something out of nothing. We've seen him do it. Remember the man born blind? He created sight where there were no eyes. So we know he can create something out of nothing. He has the power to do that, but this is not what he chooses to do. Rather than create something out of nothing, which we know he can do, he takes what little we can offer him. And in the case of our gospel today, it's five barley loaves and two fish from this boy. And he multiplies it. Do you see how that works? Rather than create something out of nothing, he chooses to take whatever we are willing to give him and multiply it. So to the one who says, well, it's a nice painting, Father, see, but no miracle has happened yet. I say, no, my friend, you are mistaken. Because the miracle is happening in this painting. Because you see, the miracle is in the gift Begging the question, what are you willing to offer Jesus today so that he might multiply it and make his kingdom come to pass? Because hear me when I say, my friends, the miracle is you. 
Speaking of miracles, as I mentioned, outside of robbing a bank, there was absolutely no way that I could actually afford to buy this painting. Because, like a lot of fine art, it was way too expensive. I could never afford a painting like this. But I had a pretty good relationship with the owner of the gallery. So I asked him one weekend if I could borrow that painting to use as I gave my homily on the feeding of the 5,000. And he said, sure, just be careful with it, which of course I was. And so through the weekend, I set the painting on an easel and through all the masses, I gave the homily just as I gave it to you. And as I was going through it, and I, I can't remember exactly what point it was. I, I, I think it was the woman, the, the mother. I got a bit emotional, you know, I got a little choked up. You know, it happened. So Monday morning when I returned the painting to the gallery, I thanked the curator and went home. And a couple hours later, I got a call from the gallery. They told me to come pick up my painting. I said, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me? They said that some anonymous donor had been so moved by the message that they called into the gallery and bought the painting from me. I get emotional just thinking about it. I guess the miracle multiplied. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? Because the best vitamin for a Christian is B1. This is Daily Living, I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you enjoyed what you heard today, consider Daily Living with Father Chapin in book form. Every homily for a year following the Gospel of Matthew. Available today in paperback, hardcover, or Kindle ebook. Download at Amazon. Daily Living with Father Chapin. Reflections on the Gospel of Matthew.